Welcome to another edition of the Watching Adams podcast series. I'm Danny Ladoni, the publisher of Watching Adams. In today's episode, we'll actually be going to a classroom presentation that I gave at Adams State University via Skype because I, at this date, am still banned from physically setting foot on the campus. However, for the past three years, I have been presenting in Dr. Ben Waddell's social psychology course, focusing on the interrelated issues of media violence, Columbine, and my own professional efforts to try and disambiguate the two with Super Columbine Massacre RPG, the video game, playing Columbine, the documentary. But also today... The focus really shifted onto my work with watching Adams and being banned from campus. In order to protect the confidentiality of the students, Dr. Waddell gathered their questions and rephrased them so that you will be able to hear them. There were about 16 students in the class this day, and our conversation ranged from a number of issues regarding watching Adams, video game and real world violence, and Adam State's own decision to ban me from campus, citing Super Columbine Massacre RPG as among the reasons. All right, Danny, well, uh, welcome. Um, you're with uh, Soch 401. Uh, kind of strange because in the past you've actually been sitting here to my right. Um, for this this conversation. So why don't we start with this? Why don't you just briefly introduce yourself to the class as you normally would if you were sitting here next to me? Uh, and, and then we'll start with a round of questions. Sure. Uh, my name is Danny Ladoni. Uh, I grew up here in Alamosa, Colorado. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in visual media arts from Emerson College, and I have a master's in fine arts in film and electronic media from American University. Uh, I often introduce myself by saying I'm a filmmaker and professor. Um, I have taught at Adams State for four years between 2011 and 2015. I've also taught at American University and a variety of other uh, experiential learning programs like summer camps and workshops and things of that nature. Uh, And I've been making films since about 1998. So we were chatting and one of the students has a question about what is the purpose or the underlying purpose in watching Adams? where do you see it going? And I think a related question um, is, would you have started watching Adams if you had been offered a job at Adams State University in the first place? Yeah, maybe I'll answer that in the reverse order. Um, as much as I would like to believe I would have started watching Adams anyway, uh, that's probably not true. I should start by saying that uh, during 2011 to 2013, or maybe it was just 2012 to 2013, uh, the faculty at Adams State produced a monthly newsletter called the Billy Pulpit, named after Billy Adams. And that was an enjoyable way to communicate ideas and concerns about the university as kind of uh, really the only internal publication uh, created by members of the faculty. And I thought that was a valuable effort. And, you know, when the faculty member who was editing that publication left, it just created this void uh, in communication. And so often I would be in meetings with colleagues and we would talk about, gosh, maybe there's some way we could bring the Billy Pulpit back. And, uh, and watching Adams is not exactly the Billy Pulpit in its design or execution, but it's intended to serve very much the same, uh, the same ends. Uh, which would be, uh, as the, uh, the site describes, um, to, to fill in a gap whereby critical information and analysis uh, about the university can be disseminated and with the recognition that, that many faculty and staff don't feel comfortable uh, speaking out as a named source on issues that might concern them uh, for a variety of reasons related to their own careers or to their, uh, their families or colleagues. And so watching Adams became a way to start communicating those ideas and concerns um, with someone such as myself who is in a position to do that, a position that I wouldn't have been in before. So, you know, the old saying that when, uh, when life closes a door, it sometimes opens a window. 
which of course means you have to climb in through the window, which isn't always uh, pleasant. But, you know, nonetheless, I felt like this was an opportunity to do something that hadn't been done before, and I likely was the only person that was in a position to do it. Uh, in terms of its long-term goals, um, look, I think watching Adams can be whatever it needs to be. Uh, one colleague from another institution said, you know, every college or university should have a watching website. There should be a watching Western State. There should be a watching CU Boulder. There should be a watching UNM, right? Because uh, we're seeing problems across higher education uh, that deserve some measure of uh, scrutiny and discourse. And uh, sites like this are intended to be a way to organize around and think about the challenges that we, that we face. Okay, so the, the next question is, and there might be a little bit of a lull as I step over and ask questions and then come back. Um, so we, we had talked in class in preparation for this uh, conversation about kind of your trajectory at Adam State, which you just uh, kind of updated us on. Um, what do you think is behind you not receiving um, the, two, the two jobs or, or at least um, an on-campus interview for the jobs that you applied to? Um, in, in 14, 15, and 13, uh, 14. Sure. Uh, some of this I will be able to talk about more openly than others. Um, I would start by saying generally, higher education is somewhat strange in that it's one of the only fields or the only careers where you're not chosen by your boss, uh, but you're actually chosen by your coworkers essentially. Uh, and that creates a variety of interesting problems, particularly if you are an internal candidate who's been working at that institution for some time. So as a result of that, there's plenty of room for speculation. Um, but what I do know, uh, and I've stated publicly, upon reviewing my own score sheets, which are the, the primary written indicators of one's application, um, that there were a number of, of problems with that uh, search. And uh, the Office of Equal Opportunity and I have reviewed that and identified those problems. And, you know, I haven't yet had um, audience with the administration on those issues that I've identified, and it seems by now that they're not really interested in talking about that further. But uh, I, if I could speculate, I would say that, um, you know, it, it doesn't take more than one or two members on a search committee that may have strong uh, biases against you um, to steer a committee away from making a recommendation to, to hire you. And it would appear as though something of that nature took place uh, in my case. What, what are your plans now, Danny, as, as you find yourself continuing to work on watching Adams and uh, both working on this issue, but also thinking about your life moving forward? There are a few points in your life where you have the opportunity for introspection. One of them is getting a divorce or breaking up with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Uh, another is uh, when you move because it forces you to unpack and repack yourself and your life. Uh, and I would say that, uh, that major career shifts are also an opportunity for introspection about what's important to you, what you enjoy. Uh, and that's certainly something that I've undergone and to some extent continue to undergo. Um, I certainly enjoy teaching and I miss not being in the classroom. Uh, I, however, also really enjoy the work that I've been doing for Watching Adams. Um, and sort of doing more of a, a news editor, publisher, uh, journalism uh, kind of track. Uh, and I also, of course, still have my video business and do a variety of work uh, here in the community, um, most notably a few nonprofits such as the Rio Grande Healthy Living Park, um, where I produce media for um, a local farm park, which you may know about uh, just across the river, um, by the uh, by, the Alamosa City Building and Cole Park. So um, I am looking at other teaching positions. I'm not in a big hurry to move. I really intended to move back to the San Luis Valley and stay, um, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, but the foreseeable future may be over, and it may be time to start looking into more uncharted territory. So uh, we'll just have to see. 
So I, I think that's, you know, this is a really important question. It comes from a student asking about, do you think that watching Adams will have an impact um, both on the university or uh, on universities across the nation? Um, and if so, what do you think that impact might be? What change might come of uh, the work that something like Ad watching Adams does? Yeah, well, uh, one of the most difficult things to do is to predict the future. Um, I will say that it's clear that watching Adams has already had some measure of impact in terms of how the institution has had to respond um, to individual articles that have identified just technical errors, like the issue with the human resources website that was um, that was forcing users to log in with their credentials to be able to access public data. Well, they had to change that. And the reason they changed it, one would think, is because we wrote an article about that and many people then expressed concern. Um, in a more long-term sense, it's clear from the most recent faculty senate meeting that Watching Adams uh, has published articles and data about the university's compensation policies that are, are currently under review. And I think many faculty and staff are beginning to realize that uh, the administration may not always have their best interests at heart and they're making decisions that reflect that. So it may compel faculty and staff to become more active and engaged in the decision-making process at their workplace, which is often called shared governance. And there's a lot of talk recently about how to improve shared governance at Adam State. Um, and so I'm seeing watching Adams become a place for people to come together and talk about those issues. Um, you know, ironically, Watching Adams wasn't designed to be a website that tracks the the day-to-day -day controversy of Danny Ladoni being banned from campus. Uh, but because Danny Ladoni is banned from campus, that raises a whole separate set of issues around campus safety, around intellectual freedom and... Uh, freedom of expression, and certainly around how universities make decisions and to whom they are accountable uh, when those decisions are made. And we're, we're seeing that play out a little bit every day. So I have two follow-up questions to that, and I think this will help us get into terrain that might be more interesting um, in terms of, you know, kind of a student perspective. Uh, one, how many, could you share with us more or less how many people are looking at watching Adams per day? Um, I, I know you don't have individual you know, names, but you have IP addresses. Can do you, do you get a sense of how many people are actually tuning in to watching Adams? Yeah, I actually don't track IP addresses if some of you are concerned about that. Um, what I do, though, is I get a daily summary of the number of visits to the website and the number of unique visitors. Um, Monday was our uh, highest record ever. We had over 2,000 views to the website on Monday. Uh, which means that uh, hundreds of visitors spent, uh, spent time clicking around on various links to the site. And so what we're seeing is the number of users is growing, but the number of views is growing exponentially because as we produce more content, people are spending more time on more parts of the site. And it's being updated all the time, of course, with more articles, with more press, and with, uh, with more comments from users. So um, we, this week, have cracked over 10,000 views, and uh, it seems to be somewhat exponential. Now that more news outlets are covering Watching Adams, now that more people are interested in the controversy around me being banned from campus and the other issues that Watching Adams is raising, it's getting a lot of word of mouth and it's getting a lot of uh, viral interest. So yeah, we, you know, we have 10,000, I would say at projected levels, we're going to reach 20,000 in a week or so. Okay, and then, you know, kind of a follow-up question from a student perspective, um, a lot of this has to do with, or, or at least the debate, has surrounded this idea of public safety. Uh, the chief of police sent an open letter to campus, which was addressed to students. It wasn't received by students, but it was received by faculty and staff. Um, and one of the first things that they put on that list had to do with a video game that you created um, about a decade ago, and then a subsequent um, documentary uh, became kind of a topic of conversation on campus um, in which you address the reasons uh, that you, you created this video game. Could you speak a little bit to this idea of 
the administration's accusations of you being a, a public threat and whether or not um, you think they, they had any reason to bring up these video games and docu the documentary created in the first place? Well, it's always flattering when the chief of police takes an interest in your uh, body of work, right? Um, so it is somewhat perplexing, obviously, that a video game that I created in 2005 is cited in 2015 as the reason for me being a potential threat to campus, uh, despite working at Adam State from 2011 to 2015. And among the reasons that I was hired in 2011 was the fact that I have a long history of media production, including the creation of Super Columbine Massacre RPG. So uh, there seems to be some wires crossed within the institution about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And uh, as, as one might initially think, oh, it's very compelling that there's this safety risk posed by this individual that made a video game glorifying Columbine where you shoot students to get points. Um, anything other than a, a, just a cursory... Uh, superficial view of my work history, um, including the Columbine game, would suggest otherwise. So, uh, but again, if you're trying to paint Danny Ladoni as a threat to campus safety, if that's your modus operandi, how could you ignore the fact that he made a video game about Columbine? I mean, look, in the same year, 2005, um, I made a short mockumentary about caffeine as a dangerous and addictive drug that you should keep your children away from. Uh, and I also did a variety of nonprofit video work for organizations, institutions. I filmed weddings. I mean, just go to my CV. You'll see that I have like over 150 production credits. So if, if one thing that I made 10 years ago is uh, the primary grounds for uh, removing me from campus, you should all be at least somewhat skeptical about that. You know, and, and this builds on this. Um, it, it turns out I, I asked this class and I've asked lots of other classes uh, whether or not they've ever played violent video games. And, and most people raise their hand at least once. Um, is there any danger in, in this, this relationship, this correlation between the idea that video games might uh, spawn violence in society in general? I mean, do you, do you see any problems with that? With, uh, with that, that idea? That idea. Okay. Just a quick review. Has this class seen playing Columbine? No. Okay. All right. So that, that helps me at least know what to say and not to say already. Um, so in the documentary playing Columbine, I focus heavily on the notion that video game violence uh, causes or triggers or influences acts of real world violence. Uh, and the film also looks at this notion that rather than being a director uh, of our actions, that art such as interactive media can be a reflector of our actions, that, that, that video games are reflective of who we are and the human experience rather than video games uh, compel us to the experiences that we have. Um, so it is problematic, and I think, you know, look, that argument has basically gone away in most serious sectors of society. During the 2000s, you know, really starting with Columbine, if not before with games like Mortal Kombat in the mid-90s, that really uh, triggered this debate about video game violence, largely because video games began to become more graphically sophisticated, so they weren't abstract cartoons anymore. You were seeing blood and gore. And the problem that the video game industry created for themselves was marketing themselves as um, the manufacturers of children's toys. And because they had uh, branded themselves as making family-friendly entertainment, now that they were making games like Doom, the fighting game, uh, they were getting a lot of pushback, and suddenly toy stores like Toys R Us uh, were very uncomfortable because they were in, in some sense marketing adult or at least teenage products to, uh, you know, in a store full of, of children's toys. Uh, so that really kicked off the debate. But look, by the late 2000s, by the time the uh, Supreme Court heard the case Schwarzenegger versus EMA, where the video game industry alleged that uh, the state of California had uh, restricted their, uh, their First Amendment rights by placing prior restraint on the sale of mature-rated video games to minors. 
um, there was, you know, the issue was kind of done. I mean, the Supreme Court ruled that video games are a protected form of speech and that, that you can't um, require by government, by law, um, that you are not allowed to, to view uh, that content. Now, the only restriction that's really been carved out has been for uh, pornography, uh, and that has a certain set of restrictions that are enforced by law. But um, when you go to an R-rated movie, um, if you, you know, if, if you're carded, um, it's not because there's a law preventing you from seeing an R-rated movie as a minor. It's because that business is voluntarily choosing to participate in the uh, Motion Picture um, Association of America's rating system. Now, to you, that might sound like a distinction without a difference, but the difference is uh, the industry has voluntarily offered up regulation um, um, guidance, but not a law that would be used for consumers to make their own decisions. It's the same way video games have a rating right on the front of the box, and they have since the, the controversy around Mortal Kombat. Um, so I think this issue has largely gone away, but for uh, the fact that it's now used, you know, in connection with allegations that this or that uh, violent individual played video games, and that caused the, uh, that caused the uh, behavior but even now, I mean, I'm thinking about high-profile shootings like Sandy Hook or the Aurora Movie Theater or others more recently. I really haven't heard video games come up much at all. And I think it's because we've heard this argument so many times. Judge after judge in many uh, federal and district courts have just thrown out the video games made me do it argument. Um, and we're a generation of people that grew up playing video games, so we're not nearly as terrified as our parents were of this unknown, uh, you know, medium that could be influencing our children to do evil things. Uh, the last point I'll make about that is in playing Columbine, the first part of the film talks about how this is a, almost a generational problem. I mean, we can start as early as jazz music, you know, in the 1920s, and this fear that people were engaging in all kinds of immoral and seedy behavior because they were listening to this devil's music. This continued with Elvis and rock and roll music, uh, even pinball machines, which some of you may never have even seen in person before. Pinball machines were also vilified as being dangerous and immoral. Uh, comic books, also during the 1950s and 60s, were seen as the gateway to immorality for Im impressionable children. Uh, and then, you know, into the 80s, we had the Dungeons and Dragons role-playing game controversy, and we saw that more recently with Pokemon or Magic the Gathering, card games. I mean, every generation seems to have something that older people are afraid of, they don't understand, um, and, uh, and we should be very careful uh, when we hear someone say, oh, well, this is different because, you know, this is just somehow going to warp our minds in ways that these other mediums that we already accept uh, don't. This is a social psychology class, as you know, and you've walked into, uh, into my class before and, and heard similar questions. Um, th there is research that demonstrates that, at least for a short time period, viewing violence or participating in violence um, is, is not necessarily, it doesn't reduce um, aggression with individuals, but rather it might actually spike aggression psychologically for a short period of time. Um, I think the student that asked this question might be thinking of a piece we read earlier in the semester where boxing matches were demonstrated to lead to spikes in violence and homicides across the nation um, in the days that followed, specifically two or three days after. Um, so what, what do you make of this, you know, this body of research that demonstrates that uh, media may influence violence, at least in the short run, um, but maybe in this larger picture uh, doesn't have as much of an influence as we think. Um, you know, look, if media had no influence on us, none of us would spend much time consuming media, right? I mean, we only go to see a film or we only watch a sporting event on TV or we only read a book because it creates compelling experiences for us, right? It's not as though this were a completely neutral proposition. Uh, however, 
many, many of these studies have either been called into question or it just raises the more uh, general problem of how imperfect social sciences can be with regard to measuring things like aggression. You know, in one study, for example, measuring aggression, uh, they had people play violent video games and then they had the opportunity to, you know, punch a punching bag or a blow-up doll or something as a, as a means of um, as a getting out aggression right? But then they found, rather than playing violent video games, if they just had them play driving games, you know, where you're, you're driving around a racetrack or something, um, that, that also increased aggression. And that was because, you know, when you, when you veer off the track, you get frustrated, you get upset, you get angry. So it may not actually be anything to do with the violence in the game. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm playing a good game of Tetris uh, and it doesn't do what I want to, I yell at my, uh, my screen or my keyboard, right? So it may not necessarily be the violence, quote unquote, that we're reacting to, but rather the engagement that we're having with that media. Um, and there are certainly a variety of uh, types of media where, where that engagement does to some degree change or elevate our, our senses. If you walk out of a comedy, right, your initial reaction as you walk out of a, a comedic film is going to be different than if you walk out of uh, a, a heart-wrenching, dramatic, uh, tragic film versus an action movie. Um, these, these are normal responses that we all have. Um, the dangerous leap, of course, is to think that, that media is so powerful and we are so impressionable to it that we have little agency over our own actions after we have uh, consumed media of any kind and we're now, you know, essentially becoming these, I don't even know if you'll know this term, Manchurian candidates, right, that we're being programmed by the media to then go out and do things. And, uh, you know, look, if media is an influence on our overall pattern of behavior, it's such a marginal uh, influence. It has such a minimal impact. I mean, if you look, for example, at the biographies of individuals who actually commit school shootings, um, and this is part of the reason I played um, that I created the Columbine video game is because they, you know, those two boys were consuming the same media as most people in their generation, right? So whatever it was that caused them to commit the uh, violence at Columbine, it wasn't because they were playing Doom or uh, listening to Natural Born Killers um, uh, or, or watching that film or things of that nature, uh, because millions and millions of people were doing that. So just from a statistical standpoint, it's statistically insignificant that one person played Grand Theft Auto and then, uh, and then shot someone in their neighborhood the next day when Grand Theft Auto is like basically the number one selling video game of all time, um, at least as, as far as M-rated games go. Uh, so that's what we should be careful about. Um, Every social scientist will tell you that more research is needed uh, or that, um, that correlation does not mean causation. And I think that's very much the case in violent media. Because when you actually look at the history of these individuals who commit school shootings or other rampage, there is such a confluence of compounding factors uh, in their life that often include uh, mental health problems, that often include, um, obviously, the access to, uh, to firearms and other means of mass destruction, that often include social isolation and the inability to maintain uh, friendships or romantic relationships. You know, if you're going to give me um, a dollar for, uh, for every person that played a violent video game, and I'm supposed to bet on who it is that's going to commit uh, violence as a result, uh, that's a losing bet. Pretend, you know, I think a, a decent follow-up question would be, um, I, I'm going to assume that, uh, well, I'm just going to ask you straight out, do, do you think that you represent a threat to campus? No, I don't believe that I represent a threat to campus at all. Okay, and, and I assume this, this would be your response. Um, campuses, however, across the nation, right, uh, have seen an uh, a rise in public shootings and campus shootings in recent decades, specifically the last 10 years. Um, what do you think would be the proper response of a university? What, 
what do you think? So if there are a bunch of compounding effects that actually lead to public violence, um, where might we focus our attention? Uh, and, and then a follow-up question on top of that or leading out of that would be, um, in terms of the administration's response to you, um, if we were actually talking about somebody that were a threat to campus, uh, do you think that would have, do you think banning that person from campus would have led to them um, not engaging in violence on campus? Sure. Um, obviously, this subject is somewhat uncomfortable to talk about because it somehow implicates me as a, as a potentially violent person, and I just reject that outright. It's not who I am. Uh, anyone who knows me finds these allegations to be completely stunning uh, and bizarre. Um, but, you, you know, we could probably make at least one significant distinction before we speak further, which is that some, um, some of this rampage violence uh, on campuses, in the workplace, etc., is caused as a, as a direct kind of retaliatory measure uh, against the, the perceived injustices that one experiences, Right. So someone who was laid off from work, there was a really unfortunate case in Virginia a couple of months ago where an ex-employee of, uh, of a news station walked up to a newscaster and a cameraman and opened fired one day while they were on the air. Um, and so that, you know, that was clearly someone who uh, is uh, uh, upset uh, ex-employee. And that's the that's the um, accusation that's essentially being made of me. Uh, however, there are many other examples of rampage shootings where the individual had no known or no clear connection to the, uh, to the crime scene, such as Adam Lanza Sandy Hook, um, or you know other shootings where the individual, like the Aurora movie theater, is just choosing a location where they can maximize casualties uh, prior to having any police intervention. Um, and that's a worthy distinction because it speaks a lot to motive, right? Why is this person engaging in this behavior to begin with? And that, that speaks to a comprehensive threat assessment that should be done when one believes an individual may be a threat to campus safety or a threat to society at large. So in many ways, uh, what Adam State has done in this case is really running contrary to you know, all the best recommendations that the FBI, the Secret Service, and other organizations have made with regard to potential threats. When it's believed that someone could be a threat to the campus or to the community, uh, the first thing to do is to engage with that individual directly, right? Have, um, have a variety of uh, resources and tools to evaluate their mental health, to evaluate uh, their, their means, motive, and access to, um, to weapons or uh, anything else that may be harmful. Uh, I mean, recognize that while uh, men, particularly white men, are the most likely to commit these kinds of rampage shootings, this sometimes is just an outgrowth of, uh, of depression and suicidal behavior, uh, which many of us experience and, and take that, that violence upon ourselves in the form of suicidal behavior or actual suicide. Um, whereas, you know, the, the rampage shooter essentially does not want to survive the encounter. And so they'll either be uh, captured or they will um, die from a self-inflicted gunshot wound or they'll die because, uh, you know, an officer opens fire to stop them. So, you know, the first thing to understand is that, that most rampage shooters have no intention of surviving the encounter. They're not planning some grand getaway. This is the end for them. And when you understand that, you can start to look more into the psychological needs and patterns that they fit so that you can start addressing them and getting them help. Whereas if your strategy is to, you know, as Adam State has done, issue a piece of paper saying that person is banned from campus, uh, and then you proceed to, um, you know, publicly defame uh, and humiliate them, or at least attempt to, you're only making the problem worse, right? You're only um, compelling that individual to be more upset and to feel more disconnected and despondent 
rather than finding a way to actually assess if they're a threat and then engage with them regularly to reconnect them with society rather than disconnect them with society. So in many ways, Adam State has done the absolute opposite of what they should do if they believe someone is really a threat. I hate to say this, but there's nothing that prevents me or anyone else who has a grudge against Adam State from walking onto campus today or tomorrow or next week, right? What matters is that when we identify concerns, that we, you know, that we conduct an investigation, bring it to that person's attention, uh, and, and figure out if they're an immediate threat, then they need to, they need to go into, into custody. You know, I had a friend years ago who attempted suicide. He spent the next month in a, in a clinic where they, you know, figured out what medications he might need. They figured out what mental health problems he might have. Uh, and he re received a complete recovery. And now he's a successful adult. And I'm sure he'd prefer not to even think that happened at all. Right. But that's the kind of thing you need to do. And the fact that Adam State has issued this piece of paper banning me from campus, but there's been no follow up to actually evaluate my mental health, to actually evaluate any of uh, any of these concerns, um, tells me that they're not actually serious uh, with regard to campus safety, particularly when President McClure states in the Valley Courier that I'm engaging in terrorism. I mean, the word terrorism has specific legal and political meaning. You can't just say that as though it were some useful piece of rhetoric, right? If I'm actually engaged in terrorism, which is the willful destruction of people or property uh, to meet political goals and to, to strike fear into your opponents, um, yeah, then the FBI would have investigated this by now, right? We have... Uh, we have a terrorism response force in this country uh, that looks at these kinds of issues. Uh, and clearly law enforcement, even the Alamosa PD, has not seen this as a, as a real issue. So it does beg the question, what other motives might be at play? And uh, a question, you know, kind of building on this, if um, let, let's move away from the, the idea of, you know, the accusations that were made against you. Uh, if public safety wasn't the actual concern of the administration, what do you think it might be about what was published in Watching Adams that could help us understand why this persona non grata notification was given to you? Um, specifically, one of, our one of my students asked, uh, did you see in looking at the salary sheets, for example, which I think our understanding was that was the first thing that you published, uh, some of the, among the first the documents you published on Watching Adams, what, what did you see in those numbers that might have led an administration to, to want to silence, uh, to silence you? Um, specifically, she'd asked about, was there any gender pay gap um, in, the, in the data you saw or any other things that, that might have led to concern on the administration's part? Sure. Yeah, with regard to gender pay, that is something we're still looking into because we need to be able to effectively identify by gender each of these positions. Um, but clearly, if you look at the, uh, the salary sheets and especially the, um, the COOPA data that actually looks at the peer group average, which means, you know, what does Ben's position pay at Adam State versus uh, the national average of institutions like Adam State. And so that data did reveal a number of uh, really troubling uh, numbers, all of which you can read about at Watching Adams, and we'll continue to publish on that. Um, but look, what's interesting here is you won't get a straight answer from the administration about what their concerns for me are. You know, in the same article, really in the same paragraph of that article uh, in the Valley Courier, um, President McClure asserts, for example, that watching Adams had nothing to do with uh, banning me from campus, because if she said that, that would mean that she's attempting to violate my First Amendment rights, and she doesn't want to go down that road. The administration doesn't want to go down that road. But later in the same paragraph, she says, oh, well, this is part of a two-year pattern of behavior, and that the creation of the website, the blog, and all of the harassment that Ladoni is doing that that's why uh so you know it's like well which is it um but you know i'm looking at the timeline of events and it's ironic because the less i was on campus beginning in september uh the more apparent concern uh the administration had for me being a threat to campus safety um but i'll be pretty candid with you uh adam state over 
the last decade, if not longer, but certainly in the last five years that I've been observing, Adam State has burned a lot of people. I mean, many people give up uh, with their individual issue and seek employment elsewhere, or they're, they're actively looking for another job, uh, and they um, the one day they're just gone, and you're like, oh, I guess they must have been looking for a while because they're teaching somewhere else now. Um, so Adam State has a major problem with turnover, and I was watching colleague after colleague just kind of leave, you know, and, and disappear. Uh, we wrote an article called Adam State Throws Its Employees Down the Memory Hole, which is a reference to the book 1984. We just kind of, you know, toss people aside and forget about them, and the administration has really enjoyed uh, not having to be particularly accountable for all the people that it disposes of along the way. Because uh, what are you going to do, right? If you speak out, you're branded as a troublemaker, and it's going to hurt your career, or people are concerned that, you know, you speak ill of this organization, no one else will hire you. And it represents a genuine problem, not just for Adam State, but for all of higher education, because you have a whole workforce that moves through the system without much opportunity for self-correction. Because when people stand up, whether they're whistleblowers or whether they're just, you know, open critics or, you know, even uh, agitators within the workplace trying to organize or trying to, um, to bring together some collective action, uh, those efforts have serious career consequences for individuals. So, you know, uh, we're seeing, in my case, someone who for two years attempted to secure full-time employment, uh, noticed problems in the hiring process, when those problems were raised, the administration essentially ignored the issue. Um, I then tried several times to meet with the board of trustees, negotiate some kind of uh, uh, compromise or win-win situation. Uh, I also offered mediation so that we could just sit down and talk about what's going on. But I saw a pattern whereby Adam State administration just removed me from every area they could in the hopes that I would go away. And because I live here, because I still work here in my own capacity, uh, I wasn't interested in going away, right? If I leave the San Luis Valley, it's going to be on my terms, and it's not going to be because Adam State pushed me out. Uh, and I I'm sure administrators were upset by that. You know, I remember one faculty senate meeting at the beginning of this semester that I attended, and there was a prominent member of the administration in attendance that day. Uh, and when I walked in, that person looked up at me, and it looked like they'd seen a ghost. I mean, they were just, you know, they were aghast that I was walking into this, this meeting. And so clearly the gears started turning. How can we get rid of this guy? And so, you know, literally the day before I was banned from campus with this letter, um, I had received an email from the president stating that I wasn't permitted to attend administrative meetings uh, as a non-employee. And so I wrote back to say, well, I'd like to know which meetings you consider administrative and what policy you're using to make that determination. You know, Adam State has dozens of committees um, many of whom meet maybe once a semester or, uh, or there often. And so I wanted to know, well, what meeting am I not allowed to attend? And if faculty senate is considered administrative, uh, even though it contains no administrators, it's a faculty-run body, uh, how is she determining this? Well, I guess that was a question she didn't feel like answering, so she just banned me from campus instead. So why would someone one day say you can't go to administrative meetings and then the next day say you're banned from campus if the concern was that that person was a threat to the safety of the campus, right? It shouldn't matter which meetings I attend or not attend if this is an issue of campus safety. But if you don't want someone to continue asking difficult questions and making the administration known uh, through watching Adams and uh, my own actions, um, then yeah, I would see why you'd want to get rid of someone. So I, we, we have about 10 minutes left and I'd like to at least keep five minutes to, to debrief the students and uh, talk about next week. Um, but in you know, the four or five minutes that remain, do, could you just give the students a sense of why you think these issues um, may be important for students to think about? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, I went to college. I graduated in 2004 from from my undergrad, so that kind of gives you an idea of where I'm at. My first day of college was September 11th, 2001. All right, uh, and I was living in Boston, and one of the planes that uh, hit the World Trade Center left from Logan Airport in Boston, Massachusetts. And many people believe that this was a nationwide attack; that Boston would be next, uh, and it was it was surreal. Not just that day, but in, in the years to follow. Why am I telling you this? Uh, because my childhood does not resemble, in many ways, the America that we live in now. It's a combination of issues like school shootings, like 9-11, uh, and everything since. Going through an airport is a very different experience today than it was when I was a kid. Um, and I would say, unfortunately, much of our society is turning into that. And so every time you hear someone tell you that in order to keep you safe, this aspect of your privacy or these civil liberties need to be compromised, you should be very careful. You should be very careful because in this country and around the world in the history of government, we have seen governments continually use the issue of safety as the primary means of justifying their behavior. All right. So this happens on the local level with colleges, universities, uh, you know, city and county police forces, uh, as well as on the national level with um, with things like the surveillance state, uh, the passage of the Patriot Act uh, and all of these other ongoing security measures. I mean, just look at the police force that we have in this country. Look in Ferguson, Missouri or look in Baltimore, Maryland, or look anywhere, and you'll see a police force that does not resemble what your parents knew as the friendly neighborhood peace officer, right? You're seeing police dressed in riot gear, right? You're seeing a campus on lockdown, um, the, kind of, uh, the kind of world where you are now guilty until proven innocent, where we are going to apply the punishment and then see if you're guilty of the crime. These are deeply problematic issues for all of us as Americans. And the reason that this issue is controversial has nothing to do with who I am as an individual and just to do with the procedure that's used to uh, deny someone their due process um, and to essentially to prove them guilty until they can uh, demonstrate their innocence. Okay, well, I, th I think we're going to leave it there. I want to thank you for your time, Danny, and I, I hope it's been a valuable session for everyone included. Um, round of applause for Danny for being with us. And I'm, I'm sure if uh, anyone had follow-up questions, uh, if you wanted to, I'm sure Danny would be happy to address them. Um, or you can pass them along to me. I'd be happy to ask him and, and give you feedback. But um, I think your contact information is on the Internet, and, and I can share it with the students as well. So thank you very much for your time, and I, I do hope you have a, a good day, Danny. Great. Thank you all, and take care. Mm -hmm.